Do you have any rice starch? <laughs> nope. We got corn starch. Because this is America, not Japan. <laughs> Welcome to HBO's The Sympathizer podcast, where we're debriefing and decoding the new HBO original limited series, The Sympathizer, which is based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel of the same name. I'm Philip Nguyen, a scholar of Vietnamese American culture. And on this podcast, I'll be joined by The Sympathizer's creators, the cast and crew, and of course, author Viet Thanh Nguyen. After every episode, we'll go deeper into the characters, their motives, and how this espionage thriller slash cross-cultural satire complicates what we know about the Vietnam War, aka the American War in Vietnam, and its depiction in U.S. pop culture today. Looking at you, Hollywood. But before we get started, there will be spoilers. So go and watch episode two exclusively on Max before listening to the podcast. Today, we're diving into episode two, Good Little Asian, with executive producer Amanda Burrell. Then we'll get a sneak peek into how actor Hua Shande becomes the captain and his process to become such a complex and multi-layered character. And finally, we'll sit down with the author of The Sympathizer, Viet Tan Nguyen, about this episode and how it's similar or different from his novel. A lot happens in this episode. Before we talk with some of the cast and creators, here's a little recap and a bit of historical context for episode two that I think will help us understand some of the action and thinking behind the character's motives. The episode opens to reveal that Bone and the captain are on a road trip across the American West. But before that, they were at a vermin-infested refugee camp with the general. Any word from Claude yet? Uh, uh, my apologies, but he did mention he'd get your family settled in LA as soon as possible. Or the settlement agency does have spots in Dallas. No, I'm taking my people to sunny Los Angeles. You no, no, no. For Vietnamese refugees, fearing for their lives, forced to flee, Operation New Life offered, well, just that. A new life in America with just a pit stop in Guam for a few weeks, where the American military processed tens of thousands of refugees. From Guam, Operation New Arrivals flew refugees to one of four military bases stateside. Fort Chaffee in Arkansas, Camp Pendleton in California, Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, and Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, where our author, Viet Tan Nguyen, was processed at the age of four. In this episode, we also see the captain out in the world living in LA. First, he heads back to Cal West College, where he was once a student and now works under Professor Hammer, who's played by Robert Downey Jr., and his assistant, Miss Mori, played by Sandra Oh, in the Oriental Studies Department. Uh, Miss Mori, I'm sorry, I'm so distracted with your kimono. Do you mind? Come here. I'm sorry, just take a second. See, the traditional Japanese, the nape of the neck, unaji, is one of the most erotic parts of the human body. Oh, and they love exposing their erotic parts to complete strangers. <laughs> no, I I'm just saying you really should learn more about your heritage. That's Professor, all. I am from Gardena. No one asked JFK if he spoke Gaelic and ate potatoes every night. It's at this party that the captain and Miss Mori begin to bond, or rather grumble over the professor's overt and subtle racism. Oh, and they also start a physical relationship after the captain shares a particularly teenage moment he had with a squid. Meanwhile, the general and his family have finally left the refugee camp in Arkansas and resettled in a rundown home in LA we see the general's paranoia about a spy continue to set in, taking up alcohol to cope, first by drinking, then by selling, when he opens a liquor store nearby. At the festive opening of the general's liquor store, the captain reunites with Sonny, a former classmate of his at Cal West, and now a journalist with progressive personal politics. As the general continues to put pressure on the captain to root out the spy, he's forced into a corner eventually suggesting that Major Wan, also known as the Dumpling, is up to something. The general agrees 
and the episode ends as the captain recruits Bon to assist with the mission, Take Down Dumpling. Our first conversation is with producer extraordinaire Amanda Burrell. Amanda is currently the president of Team Downey, working alongside Robert Downey Jr. and Susan Downey. I'm so happy to welcome Amanda to the podcast. What was some of the most challenging aspects of dealing with this story and yes. the way that it calls into question or disrupts a lot of the uh, conventions of how people, especially in America, pop culture and media, the government think? Yeah. Um, what was that like for you? Well, I, you know, as a white American, I learned about the Vietnam War as America's kind of greatest tragedy and ego hit and all of the, the big massive loss and really only heard it from that point of view, obviously. And, you know, for us, the book and the script got a tone that also recognized the absurdity of it all. That war at this, you know, as tragic and horrific and obviously at the end of episode one, you are left bereft and crying and... But there's also kind of a strange humor to like, what is going on? Right. How does Claude show up and sing a song in the middle of this tarmac when people are about to leave? But what else are you left to do as right. a human? And so I think that mishmash of just real humanity in the at the core of this is what really excited us, is how do we really kind of create that tone that allows for those spaces? Right. Yeah, and it's funny. It is. Yeah. I mean, not to say that the war or its aftermath were of funny. Course. Of course, right? Um, but in the way that it is, it might trigger a lot of trauma for some folks. It yes. deals with very serious topics. There is this this sense of, but we can laugh at it. Yes. And at the same time, the another layer of complexity, since we're peeling back some of the layers of this onion that yep. is the series, you know, yep. is that we're being told the story through this, uh, the slipperiness of the narrator's memory too, the captain's memory. Yes, yes. So there's flashbacks and flash forwards that are, are happening. I think that's a really valuable point because especially Robert's characters, there's a heightened nature of them, you know, because it was really his point of view, the captain's point of view. And so I do think, you know, the captain's wrestling with the fact that obviously his, what his allegiances are right. and but America's seductive. Capitalism's seductive. So we can't judge it. He He's being pushed and pulled and, and, and doesn't really know where to fit because it is seductive, for right. lack of a better, you know. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like as someone who's watching the series, you know, we, the sympathizer as a title, we yes. are kind of, are we the sympathizer, Always. right? Um, is it the captain? Is it the people who he's like interacting with and engaging with in, in the time that he's in the United States, you know? Um, yes. The meta-ness of the series is it it's it speaks quite profoundly in that. I feel like that really begins to sink in in episode two. Yes. Well, on the high low of it too, the 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 refugee obviously camp, Fort Chaffee, was really specific. Then there's just the breathtaking West mm. that the director Park really wanted to capture. I think he was really excited about just the wide open spaces that America provides. Like Americana, the yes. promise of the American dream. Exactly. Yeah. And also I think Vietnam is wet and, and, you know, there's a different like humidity in the air. And this was just America, which is, has a kind of desert dry, just a totally different vibe. And so we really wanted to to contrast that, the episode one to episode two. And then after that, it was also about the contrast of these glamorous spaces, the parties, the whatever. And then his their home, you know, him and Bon home and, you know, and in these motel rooms that aren't the most glamorous side of America. Right. So it's kind of the, those contrasts were really clear. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. The different layers of what America is for different people, depending on who you are. Exactly. Um, and how our, na our narrator, our, our captain is kind of navigating through each of these spaces. Yep. With all of the baggage that he's bringing with him from from Vietnam. Well, and the tragedy and, and Bond sitting there absolutely bereft beyond, you know, um, I think he's oh, he Bond is the constant reminder of that. Right. Oh, I really appreciated the altars. Yeah. Um, to the lost. There was a, a sense of cultural resonance for me in seeing that and it evoked a sense of like Vietnamese Americanness, knowing that like folks like my parents were displaced from their homes and trying to find a home in a distant land was not not always the easiest. No. And also, I, I mean, I, I'm really glad to hear that because so much of what we were, uh, you know, what we really needed to do was get this right. Like this has and that all of our consultants were incredible. So many of our writers were just everybody brought 
themselves to it. Even our actors, I would say the the most kind of amazing thing about the casting process too was how many actors brought their own experience and and actually after being cast were able to have conversations with their parents right. that they had never had before. Or they would read the, they read the book just in preparation and were like, oh my gosh, I now understand my parents. I now understood, like, it was like this illuminating emotional experience for them. And then bringing that into the show was just, I mean, we used every bit of it. Yeah. I mean, you're reading my mind, Amanda. I mean, <laughs> the, the next question that I had was about, about the casting, because this yeah. is also one of the first times in, you know, history that we're seeing Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese Americans and also Vietnamese folks in diaspora playing these Vietnamese American diasporic Vietnamese roles. Could you shed some light into what this huge casting call across the globe was like and how you landed on the the folks that we see in the series? I mean, well, first of all, I should say the thing that was so clear from Jump was how many unbelievable actors there are out there that just haven't been centered and haven't been given the opportunities. The hardest thing was narrowing it down. But it all started with our captain. You know, we knew we had to get him. How and did then, you land on Hua? Yeah. Oh, man. Um, it was it was really hard. I mean, first of all, he he came in very early and we all fell in love with him because he's so soulful and quiet and thoughtful and uh, brilliant. And he was going to be the face of the show. And Robert always said he was like, I'm not first on the call sheet. The captain is first right. on the call sheet. So it's it really, it, it took a lot. Um, he read a lot of times. He did a lot of callbacks. He met with Director Park and Soul. He came out to L.A. Um, there was a lot of conversations with HBO. But honestly, at the end of it all, it, we all just looked at each other and we were like, it's him. And also, Hua has such a gentle um, spirit as like an Australian surfer, you know? Right. Um, so when you're like, you meet him, you're like, oh, wow. The, but then when he was steely and stoic and he could turn that on, and there's a mystery to him that I think for us, you know, the captain had to project this confidence and this diligence, but be smushy and vulnerable inside as, as he's wrestling with all these things. And he just, he just had all of it. Mm -hmm. Especially in episode two, when he's, you know, the betrayal oh, start yeah. to happen. Oh, yeah. um, we start to see some some darker sides to to Hua and yes. um, to some of our other characters as well. Yes. Um, I, I want to ask you also about, I mean, while we're on casting and the characters, yeah, please. the Blood Brothers. Oh, I mean, it's so interesting because Fred also we saw early in the process. And who plays Bon? Yes, who plays Bon. And he was absolutely like we were very focused on someone who could be very physical mm. because he obviously has to be a stunt man like he has to have like a physicality he was a, a war hero and I think we missed that he was going to be such an incredible emotional center of our show mm. we knew that we wanted that character to be that but once we saw him and Hua together it was like oh my gosh these guys have such a deep, deep connection. And then he happened to be best friends with Sui, who mm -hmm. is like, we, who is one of our final casting. Right. Mon was the hardest in, in a lot of ways. He had to play so many layers. He had to be so many things. And their connection was so vital. And when he got cast and we had heard that they were friends, but we didn't know how close they were, um, it all just made sense. Episode two also introduces us to some very strong women characters as oh, well. Yeah. yeah. What was that like for you to work with them? I mean, they were just, they were incredible because I think what's interesting about the show and episode two and the women is the women see things very clearly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they see it clearly. A lot of the men are clouded by their own psychological ego, m what macho, whatever posturing that you see. The women are very clear and they know what they have to do. And you'll see Madame, especially as, as the series goes on, she, she wants to take care of her family. She wants to have the pride. Um, and working with, with her, she kind of in, inherently brings all of that. She's, right. she's so present. She doesn't have to even say a whole lot. She's so present and, and just has that power. And then Sandra, I mean, she bre breathed a whole level of life into the show. You know, we, 
started shooting episode two, which is kind of unconventional because we shot episode one in Thailand at the end. So she kind of kicked us all off, I think, especially from a tonal standpoint. She allowed us to laugh. And when she and the captain are talking about that crazy squid story mm, and you... The chemistry starts building. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the chemistry is odd. They're, the fact that she's turned on by it is is a whole other layer, which is just so fun. Um, she and, and she just brought that to set. Everybody laughed around her. She just made everybody comfortable. So it was awesome having her on board. Thank you so much, Amanda, for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Now we're joined by our protagonist, the captain. Hua Shan Day is an Australian actor of Vietnamese descent, best known for his roles in Cowboy Bebop, Hungry Ghost, and Top of the Lake. He plays the captain in The Sympathizer, and we're going to learn all about how he became, as some would say, a man of two faces. Can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, what this moment feels like for you, right? I think yeah. for me, as a, a child of refugees myself, right. uh, being born and raised in the United States, it feels like we, this is our moment in, in the spotlight, right? Ooh. And you are there in the spotlight, sometimes literally, as we've seen in the first couple of episodes. Um, is it something that you, you think about? Do you feel it? Yeah, when I was taking on this project, I, I felt the gravity and the weight of the expectations of so many people who uh, of Vietnamese descent who will watch this and would want this story to be portrayed in a way that, you know, hasn't been necessarily portrayed before. Um, you know, it wasn't about me. It was just trying to do the best that I could to hopefully make those people finally feel like that they were finally represented. And I... I mean, personally, I feel like you do a great job, you oh, know, just thank to, you. just to gas you up uh, a little yeah. bit. Well, that's one. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Do you see any similarities between yourself and the, the unnamed narrator in, yeah. in the book, but the captain that you play in the series? Look, I, it's such a deep and profound journey. Um, and it's so philosophical as well, you know, especially the captain's journey of his dual identities and his, um, beliefs and what ultimately makes a good human being. Um, will he make his mother proud? Will, you know, his loyalties to his friends, like what does that mean to him? So um, these are questions that I've felt really deeply and connected to when I read them. Um, Cause I felt like I, I struggled a lot with that growing up, even in Australia, like being of Asian descent, let alone Vietnamese descent. There were, I was Def, I grew up in a, in an area and in a place where I didn't see a lot of myself. And so, you know, I, I felt a lot of the time I was reaching to be more Australian, whatever that meant. Um, uh, and I did things in a way that would make me seem more Australian. Um, but then obviously I was never that enough. And then, you know, but I never felt Vietnamese or even Asian enough to be considered that. So a lot of that was just trying to figure out who I was and I related to the captain's story so much in that way. Yeah. What was your experience like with the Vietnamese community in Australia? You know, um, there, there is a huge Vietnamese diaspora in Australia. I, um, I was born in Sydney. Uh, and then at the age of three, my parents relocated from Sydney to Melbourne. I, I felt like my parents just removed me from a lot of the Vietnamese uh, uh, community at the time because they were just chasing work. You know, when you're a refugee, you're an immigrant, you're trying to make a living and you're just chasing work wherever that may be. And so they moved to Melbourne simply because they wanted to find work and opportunities were there for them. And so I was removed from the Vietnamese community quite early on. And I grew up around an area that was just full of Australians, a lot of Greek Italians. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, growing up my, a lot of my friendship circles and groups were just full of, uh, other people other than Vietnamese people or even Asian people. Um, and it, yeah, you know, when you're young and you're growing up, I'm sure you can relate to this or a lot of people can relate to this. Uh, you know, your parents are always blabbering on about how hard things were in the war and blah, blah, blah. All the things that they went through that right, we don't, yeah, all you the know, we take for granted. how lucky we were. Exactly. And how, like, and all how, the sacrifices that yeah, they made, Yeah, and right? how we're just not appreciative of anything and how, you know, how, how selfish we all were. And, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I remember my father and, you know, even my mom just telling 
us stories about things that they went through. Um, and, and I never took them seriously and I never really paid attention to it because again, it's, 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 you know, I hate to say, but it's one of those things when you're not comfortable in your own skin, you don't feel like you relate to it. So these stories that, that are essentially part of who you are, you don't relate to, so you don't really want to involve yourself with these stories. And it's really later on in life that I, you know, through, I guess, figuring yourself out, being more comfortable with who you are, that you start to pay attention to what these stories are and mean to you, um, or even just mean to them. Um, and through obviously doing this show, um, I, I tried to connect more with what I remembered, what those stories were that my parents told me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And in this show, this very historic show, we have a, a Vietnamese cast, right? Yeah. Being able to portray and tell this, this very Vietnamese yeah. story. Um, across diaspora. And yeah. All too often when we talk about the Vietnam War and we portray that on screen as we have for, you know, all the time when we talk about it um, in Hollywood, really, uh, Vietnamese people are either, you know, w where the, the, the villages that are seeking help and, you know, we're trying to be saved or we're the Viet Cong, you know, and, right. you know, we're one or the other. We're not people who have actual stories or are in positions to lead or are in positions uh to affect change in a story we're just like the the people just getting massacred exactly or murdered yeah exactly doing the massacring or being massacred right um so i think it was really important and really just uh a profound moment you know to to have a, a story like this that actually puts Vietnamese uh, characters at the center and the forefront of telling this story. So getting into the character, like being the captain yeah. in those sorts of roles, right? Knowing the sort of ideological differences that you're, you're faced with, these conflicts. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. As, especially in this moment where you're a communist spy, but now you're a refugee, right? Yeah, and just yeah. trying to like survive at all. Yeah. Right? What was, the, that, yeah. <laughs> what was that What um, was that? research process for you like? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think when I was approaching this character, because this book on the, on the surface of it all, it's a spy thriller, right? It's an es espionage thriller. It's a guy who's playing two sides and he's like, am I going to survive or am I going to not? And I think a lot of the times we see spy tropes as just a guy with a gun running around shooting people and then hiding in the, in the shadows. And that's basically it. And I really wanted to avoid that. I really wanted to avoid just the, the surface level tropes of what a spy was. I really wanted to get to the humanity of what this character or this person was. And so I felt like I needed to connect with this person emotionally, deeply on a psychological level. So I really wanted to understand the war. I've heard stories, I've heard depictions, I've heard my parents tell stories of the war, but I really wanted to get the facts, the people who were really involved, accounts, uh, people who could really tell stories of what it was like on the ground during the time and what, how, what their fears were and what their allegiances were, what their thoughts were, the psychology of that all. So I, mm -hmm. I did a lot of deep diving, reading articles of the time, Vietnamese more so than just, you know, literary historians, um, you know, who are from the comforts of their home in the West, right? right? I really tried to get Vietnamese perspectives. And I actually stumbled upon a real life character that this character is based on that Viet borrowed from, and his name is, uh, Pham Sung An. Um, and he was a real life spy from the North, uh, who, uh, I did a really deep dive on and I watched this 10 part Vietnamese documentary. The about Ken Burns him. document. Oh, the, about him. About him. Oh, wow. About him. And he was alive at the time when they made this documentary. So I could actually hear and see him speak. Right. I see. Um, and so it was really inspiring. It was actually really inspiring to watch that documentary, to see a real life person having to, you know, portray, to, to live this life. Um, and, and all the stuff that you, you sort of read in this book, it's all feasible that he had to really walk this tightrope between playing his part for both sides, feeding information, um, you know, things that he did and said in, in moments that he thought he would literally be the end of it. Um, things that he would do, you know, he would like wrap up, you know, his intelligence in film roles in like, um, you know, Roy Gong in, oh, in yes. yeah, rice paper rolls and, uh, <laughs> Gong yeah, it. yeah. And then he would sent, put it in the mail and then he would have like handlers pick it up and walk it like 42 kilometers to like the nearest tunnel 
and then have it passed on to somebody else. And none of these people knew who they were. They were all assigned uh, code names. And this character's, uh, it's not the character, but the real life person had a code name of X6. Mm. And he would hand, it, hand these intelligence roles to his handler B2. And then they would hand it on to another person called A4. And that's all they knew of these people. They were just kept completely separate, but they were all driven towards a common cause. It was just really inspiring when I found these stories. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, I could. Um, at the same time, uh, in episode two, we are introduced to a very Asian American context, right? Yeah. Um, at Cal West College, yeah. um, we meet the professor, yeah. who is another iteration of Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, yeah. And we're introduced, right? We're we're introduced to um, your love interest, your yes. first love interest. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. My love interest. You're right. <laughs> what was it like to build the relationships with folks like Robert Downey Jr. and, and Sandra Oh? Oh, yeah. Um, it's so funny because I met them on my fourth day of filming. Um, I'd met Sandra before in a rehearsal. And let me tell you, Sandra O oh is just the most bubbly, eccentric, uh, lively, bright person that you'll ever meet. Like she is exactly the way that she is on screen as she is in real life. And so I just felt immediately taken into her warmth. And um, I say this a lot about uh, Sandra and Robert is that, uh, Sandra kind of mothered me. She like spoke up on my behalf. She was really lovely because she knew how green I was on a set like this big production, a guy that's never done, you know, something on this level before. And I was just really trying to do the best that I could and not rock the boat. And Sandra felt that from me. And so she would always step in and be like, do you need anything? Is there anything that you're concerned with? Is there anything that I can talk to the producers on your behalf for and um and she did that so i i really appreciated that and robert is was just like the 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 silly goofy father that i never had um he he kind of just came on uh on the fourth day of filming and, and that's when i first met him and um he was already in disguise in a costume and he was clawed at the time okay. as well um and i just remember him just like wrapping his arm around my shoulder and just yeah, just being really down to earth, uh, making me feel like I could just do and say anything that I felt like. And so that was really nice and warm of him and, uh, and open to just uh, taking me in, giving me advice and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, he fathered me in that way. Mm. Yeah. That's so lovely to hear. I mean, the, the sort of camaraderie that you had and y'all had on set. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and opposite of that, right, we see the captain navigate these spaces where, along with Miss Mori, right, yeah. he's almost being like objectified or even fetishized in a way yeah, by some yeah. of the patriarchal, white patriarchal yeah, characters, yeah. right? How did you navigate that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's funny because, you know, the professor is such a character, like, I, I, I don't even know how to describe it, as a representation of the 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 educational establishment of America, if you want to put it that way, the cultural establishment of America, you know, it's it's this um, white guy who obviously has an obsession with Japanese <laughs> culture and Asian culture in general, and it's like he's dictating to us what we should be, and you know, if it wasn't so sad and um, you know, anger inducing, it's actually quite hilarious to think that you know, that he is obsessed so much that he literally ca categorizes in, in his studies of us in a certain way that he teaches it to everybody that this is just what we are. Mm. Um, and you see that in Miss Maury's reactions to him. And then you see it in my character's uh, reaction to how he behaves around both of us. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, later in the episode, um, in episode two, we are then introduced to the Vietnamese American community in the liquor store yes. um, yeah, yeah. that the the borderline alcoholic general has now opened, right? Yeah, yeah. We're also introduced to Sonny for the first time, your arch nemesis yes, or your yeah. rival. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, that's interesting. Um, you know, the, cause, and I, I think we get that in the depiction in, at the liquor store of the general, but you know, the general is supposed to be a divisive figure. He's not supposed to be a lovable, uh, you know, leader of the time, mm -hmm. you know, in the community, let alone the world, like in the community, he was very divisive. People held him to the account of the fact that he 
it was the representation of the loss of the war. Right. Um, and so for many people, his promises just never uh, added up. In, it never stacked up. And so the grumbles in the community, uh, I'm sure I felt early in the refugee camp, but it really comes to fruition there when he's giving this big speech, you know, to moving on and trying to make ourselves better and, you know, that we, we can rebuild again, you know, and we see people leaving. Walking out of his speech. Yeah, walking out of his speech. And as we wrap up the second episode of the Sympathizers Companion podcast, um, for you, Hua, what has been the most surprising aspect of working on the series um, so far? Look, uh, apart from apart from just, you know, it, it, it does feel like a dream come true to be able to do a project like this on this level, on this scale with the people that are behind it. Honestly, I, it's, you know, never in a million years would I have thought I'd be sitting in this position to be able to do something like this and to be able to tell this story, to be able to, to be even able to speak about it in this way. So that is just, has been surprising to me literally for the last two years. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I, I think the thing that I've learned most about doing a project like this is that there's so many people who are looking forward to a show like this that I know from personally simply because they haven't felt like stories like this have ever been told and the Vietnam War has never really represented them. And so they're really looking forward to a story like this coming out that is finally and hopefully being able to tell a certain perspective of the stories that they've never been able to tell. And thank you for that. And with that, cut. Thank you. Our next guest needs no introduction at this point, but I will give one anyway, as without him, we wouldn't have The Sympathizer as a book, as an HBO original limited series, or this podcast. Viet Tan Nguyen is a Vietnamese American professor and author. The Sympathizer is based on his Pulitzer Prize winning 2015 novel of the same name. Viet was born in Vietnam and raised in the United States when his family came as refugees in 1975. He is a professor at the University of Southern California, a MacArthur Fellow, and a New York Times bestseller. Throughout the podcast, we'll invite Viet to talk about his novel, its HBO adaptation, our nameless protagonist, a man of two faces, and what Viet means when he says that all wars are fought twice. The first time on the battlefield, the second time in memory. Viet, um, my first question for you about episode two, where we, the captain and his crew are making their way to, to the United States. Um, the rest of the cast is introduced in this episode. There are some scenes of this episode that I feel like really spoke to me and my experience in the Vietnamese American community. Um, could you speak a little bit about how you grappled with this, uh, the, the diasporic Vietnamese community's reception of your novel, The Sympathizer, and perhaps what you anticipate um, for this particular episode of the series? I grew up in the Vietnamese refugee community in the 70s and 80s, so I think I know their, their history very intimately. And in fact, uh, the episode begins with the refugees, they have now become refugees, fleeing from Saigon and ending up in Guam. And in fact, that was my trajectory too, except I was four years old, so I don't remember any of, the, of that actual experience. So for me to write the, the, the novel dealing with this part of the TV series was really, you know, fascinating to do the research about what life was like on Guam and so on and, and what the resettlement process in the United States was like. And of course, I was resettled uh, in the United States via a different refugee camp in Pennsylvania versus Fort Chaffee, which is what we see in this episode. But I grew up feeling like I was an outsider in the Vietnamese refugee community because very instinctively, for whatever reason, I was always skeptical of the insider position. So I was very familiar with the insider position for the Vietnamese refugee community, that it was very anti-communist and it was being led by these exiled political and military figures uh, from the South Vietnamese government and military. And I would see them at Vietnamese community celebrations in full military regalia, and they were still trying to recreate South Vietnam in San Jose, California, which would entail whenever we were at one of these community gatherings that we sing the national anthem and salute the flag and you know, rehearse our commitment to the anti-communist cause. So I, I, I'm very deeply empathetic to the kinds of emotions um, that led to this, that this was a generation of people, men and women, who felt that they had lost their country, been betrayed by the communists, were very angry and very bitter in a lot of ways. But I'm also an outsider, so I'm also very skeptical of many of their beliefs, many of their convictions, their place in history, and so on. And I wanted to write a novel uh, that would not simply 
um, venerate the older generation and what they saw, but to cast them as complicated historical actors in their own drama. From an artistic perspective, that's very compelling. From the perspective of a community that feels like it's been underserved, underrecognized, misrecognized, distorted in various ways, they may not feel the same way about a story that doesn't idolize their history. Right. And it's, I think especially if they haven't finished reading The Sympathizer, right? And they really read gone. The Sympathizer? Oh, my God. Exactly. Right? I don't think it is uh, translated in Vietnamese. It is not translated into Vietnamese. And that's a whole other complicated story because the Vietnamese American community, some of them think I'm a communist. Right. Um, I've been told that. Uh, Quite often. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, the communist government thinks I'm an anti-communist, which is why they don't allow the sympathizer to be published in Vietnam. So because the novel tries to tell the truth from my point of view, that truth does not easily reconcile with these orthodoxies that are found among in the Vietnamese communist side and in the Vietnamese anti-communist side. Yeah. And we see the scene where the general puts on that full regalia and the, the response that's elicited by some of the, the women in the refugee camp, right? That is a true story, as far as I know, that uh, there was a Vietnamese general who was pelted by uh, the, the refugee women um, with fruit and vegetables or garbage of various kinds because they were obviously mad uh, that, that this is the outcome of the war that was waged. But even more than that, that they were blaming this particular general for having fled the country. Right. Now, this is based on reality, that, that Nguyen Cao Ghe, the the vice president or premier of, of the South Vietnamese government, who was also an Air Force officer, had gone on the radio saying in the final days, stand to your posts, resist the communists, fight back until the last man. And then he got in a helicopter and flew to an American aircraft carrier. Um, and certainly his character is one of the inspirations for the figure of the general. So on the one hand, there's this intense nationalism and fervent anti-communism and the spirit for warfare and everything. And as the character of Bone himself expresses in the novel, if these guys were so intent on fighting the war, why didn't they stay and fight to the last man? That's the contradiction he can't live with. Right, right. And and at the same time, we see when um, the general makes it into the United States, his sort of this role reversal that happens, right? Um, especially as they're kind of moving into this new home in L.A. before he opens a liquor store. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that that dynamic between uh, post-resettlement, right, uh, between um, some, sort of some of the familiar roles in the uh, in now a Vietnamese American family? These refugee exiles, um, the military and government types, political types, they were in charge of South Vietnam. They had the power. They had the clout. They were at the top of the hierarchy. And yet most of them did not have any transferable job skills. So right. when they came to the United States, it didn't matter if you were a Supreme Court justice or an army general or whatever, You those skills did not apply. And so it was not uncommon for these men uh, to experience downward mobility and end up doing jobs that they thought were beneath them. Uh, while their wives, on the other hand, uh, often found upward mobility because their skills, cooking or running enterprises and things like that, could be transferred into the United States. In the case of my own family, my parents were uh, business people. So they had, I don't know how much social prestige they had in Vietnam, but in the United States, they could totally recreate their lives and even do better with the economic skills that they had. So the general is forced to open a liquor store. I want to talk to you about the liquor store. There's a lot of imagery and a lot of, you know, this is sort of, I think, the in this series, the first place where Vietnamese American community post refugee resettlement gather, right? It, it feels like an insider, there's an insider conversation going on at the same time that there is this sort of maybe play on the American or mainstream trope of the South Vietnamese as corrupt soldiers, right? Uh, could you speak a little bit to that? I want to point out that when we were introduced to the liquor store, the general uh, takes the captain to the side and says, look at this horrifying graffiti that's been painted oh, on Oh, the here. image, yes. And that's an image that is of a man getting shot in the head. That's drawn from the famous or infamous Eddie Adams photograph of General Nguyen Ngoc Luan, who was actually in charge of Saigon's military police, executing a Viet Cong guerrilla on the streets of Saigon during the Tet Offensive. And that was a world-famous image that shook up political sensibilities across the globe in regards to the conduct of the war in Vietnam and helped to turn uh, a considerable number of non-Vietnamese people against the South Vietnamese government. Now, General Nguyen Ngoc Luan uh, also fled as a refugee to the United States, and he opened up a pizza parlor. 
I think in like the Northeast. Boston. I think Virginia. Yeah, I think. Virginia. Virginia or Virginia, Boston. And he never could obviously escape from the legacy of that image. So that's where the reference is. And these Vietnamese refugees have been uh, downwardly mobile, downwardly demoted into the role of small businessmen, which obviously they find quite humiliating. And of course, in the liquor store, when we're introduced to it, a new character appears, Sonny, the journalist, who's also inspired by real, a real historical figure as well. And, um, you know, that, that figure of the Vietnamese American journalist who's trying to start a Vietnamese American newspaper industry and to tell the truth and to report on the facts, this would come into conflict with the South Vietnamese exiled political regime, which did right. not want the facts because spoken he's, out loud. Because he's more of an immigrant than he is a refugee, a political refugee. Well, that's right. He, he came as a f international student along with the captain in the 1960s, but unlike the captain, stayed in the United States. And this is true. The, by the time the Vietnamese refugees arrived en masse in the summer of 1975, there were tens of thousands of them, but there were already hundreds of Vietnamese international students in the United States. And in the 1960s and 1970s, that was a divided community. There were people who supported the South Vietnamese regime, and there were people who were opposed to the South Vietnamese regime. There were radicals and leftists and so on in this Vietnamese international student community. Sonny is one of those who did not return to Vietnam, but stayed and essentially is becoming an immigrant or an American at this point, a Vietnamese American. And he is somebody who is politically out of step with this, this new influx of South Vietnamese political and military exiles. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, we've been talking about, I, I've been thinking a lot about how this, this series, the book and sitting right across from you talking about the show is very meta. I'm also thinking about Bon and, and the captain coming to the United States in this like baby blue car. And there's a line that he says, uh, which translates to, oh, I thought you liked cowboy movies. Right. So there is this sort of, um, almost allure the the promise or the opportunity of the American dream has that they're also grappling with um, as we, you know, kind of transition into talking about the Oriental and perhaps Professor Hammer's character. Um, I'm also thinking about do, do these particular refugees occupy the sort of my, my model minority white adjacent space? And is that strategic for them to be able to, you know, work around some of these, uh, this white sort of white or American paternalism guilt? patriarchy. I think there's a very explicit theme in the novel, obviously, that um, the Vietnamese have gone from being these incomprehensible uh, figures in the Vietnam War who were either the enemies or the allies of the United States, but then they come to the United States and they become transformed not into being not just Vietnamese refugees, but, it, but into being these Asian immigrants as well, which means that they're already going to be subjected to all of these preconceptions that you just outlined about, you know, Asians as a, as a model minority and, and, and their function in the United States. And so when the captain and Bon are making that cross-country road trip, you know, it's taking place against this mythical Western landscape, and it does evoke the Westerns and the cowboy movies and everything. And it's not, this is not stated super explicitly in the TV series or in the novel, but certainly when Vietnamese refugees come into the United States, we are outsiders. But our path to being insiders into being citizens is going to happen against the backdrop of anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism and the acceptance of settler colonialism uh, so that you could be a refugee and a citizen all at the same time. And then we're brought into Cal West College in the TV series, um, Occidental College in the book, where we're introduced to uh, Robert Downey Jr. again, playing the role of Professor Hammer. Does he feel real to you? Oh, he feels very real. I mean, I, I think Robert Downey Jr. does a great job in all of the roles. Um, right, because he felt real to me. Oh, being yeah. Being someone yeah. in, you know, in academia to think, you know, maybe a little quite exact, a little bit exaggerated, but I imagine that's what happens behind those those closed office doors. Okay, let me just point out a real historical thing that happened to me uh, with a real Professor Hammer figure, which is I was hired at USC as a professor in 1997, and uh, I met this other professor, an anthropology professor, a white guy, and every time... I met him in the hallways. He would just give me this look and I would just get creeped out, you know. And as it turned out, this particular professor specialized in Asian studies and then eventually uh, fled to Mexico and was put on the top 10 wanted list by the FBI for the things that he was doing with Southeast Asian boys when he was going on his research trips. So whatever Professor Hammer represents as a satirical character, it's not as if these things did not happen in reality. And his particular predilections, personal predilections, are fused with his political ideas and with his methodological research and his whole view of the Orient. 
And I, I also want to point out that, that you know, it, the, the, there's, there's an intense satire of so-called Oriental studies that's taking place through him and through the name of his department. But it was really the, the screenwriter for this episode, Nomi Azuka, who put the words Asian American studies in the mouth of the professor. Like, oh, he's like, who are these Asian American studies people? And it's like, it's, why, right. what are they threatening to do here? So, so scandalous. And I, that is not actually in the novel. And I thought that is brilliant. It I should have, I should have put it in there. Because it's happening at this time where Asian American studies, which was founded in the 60s, uh, the late 60s, 68, 69, the Third World Liberation Front at San Francisco State and at UC Berkeley, um, Students were on strike and they had fought for there to be a third world college that ended up being a, for the most part, Department of Ethnic Studies. 1975, when these refugees arrive and, and uh, the captain sees Professor Hammer again on, the camp, on this college campus. In fact, that is pretty much the turning point for the college radicals of the, of the 60s at Berkeley, at UCLA, at San Francisco State. For, that's the turning point for when they start to get a toehold in the university. Asian American studies classes have been created. They're starting to be taught by these radical activists who are being, becoming assimilated into the university. That's exactly what Nomi is referring to in putting those words in Professor Hammer's mouth. Mm. And we are also introduced in that same department to Miss Mori, who is played by Sandra Oh. Oh, Sandra is lovely. She does a great job. She was always my first choice for the part of Ms. Mori. But um, the character of Ms. Mori is, is really, I hope, very funny and very, um, you know, feminist and very Asian American. And she's in there to serve as the voice of, a, of, a, of, a, of this Asian American feminist political consciousness that is completely alien to Professor Hammer, but also a little sh quite strange to the captain himself who has to grow up, who has to change, who has to recognize some of, the, of his limitations that Ms. Mori will be able to point out. Let's, let's talk about that, be it the naivety of our dear captain. We get some flashbacks around the captain's naivety and his uh, coming of age sexually in, how do I say it, in cephalopod form. Um, squid, was that? squid, you can say it. <laughs> Insert squid emoji yeah. here, you know. Um, yeah, but th the squid. Uh, you've, you've spoken a lot about the squid, but I, I've got to ask because it, do you feel like the, the, the series did this, the squid scene justice? So anybody who's watched this episode realizes that our captain loses his virginity to a dead squid. And I had a lot of fun writing that, partly because it is a semi-autobiographical experience. And um, it's a reference also to Portnoy's Complaint by, by Philip Roth from 1968, a very famous and popular and scandalous novel at the time in which Alex Portnoy, the very horny um, narrator of that book, basically masturbates with anything he can get his hands on, including a slab of liver from the family fridge. Um, and then after he finishes his business with that slab of liver, he puts it back in the fridge where the family will then consume it for dinner later that night. And when I read that novel, I was 12 or 13. It's all I would remember for the next 20 or 30 years. And all I could think about was, wow, that's gross. They eat liver for dinner. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, what was gross? <laughs> yeah. But we ate liver growing up. So right. to me, it was like perfectly normal. I totally identified with this scene. And so I'm, I'm so delighted that Director Park and uh, Don McKellar and uh, Nomi Izuka found a way to include that very graphic <laughs> scene in this episode. Yeah. And I, and I think for the captain, for the captain as we're making our way through this episode, he's he's kind of got game in using the the scene to uh, to woo Miss Mori, right? Or to, to get them on the same page. So let me point out something very, really crucial. Uh, uh, according to Amazon.com and Goodreads reviews, I'd probably read, lose about one or two percent of readers right at this moment at the squid masturbation scene because that percentage of readers thinks this is so gross. How can you continue? Uh, and then, of course, if you read the end of the scene in the novel, the line that the captain says is, yes, you know, if only murder and massacre made us mumble as much as the word masturbation. That's the point. OK, um, we're willing to accept all these horrifying things that happen because our nation state says it's OK for us to kill people. But masturbating with a squid off limits. Let's ban books at this point. Um, and the, the combination of sex and violence is a theme that runs throughout the entire novel and the TV series. So if you if you watch the series all the way to the end, there will be a very crucial way that this thread continues. But the captain doesn't get it. The captain only gets, un you said naivete. The captain only understands part of this, that line about murder, massacre, masturbation. He does not yet realize that he himself is not just a critic. He is also deeply implicated 
in this nexus of sex and violence and the objectification of women and squid. And it's Miss Mori who will be part of the puncturing of that consciousness, but the rest of the plot will force the captain to, to fully confront how deeply invested he is as a man in this system of objectification and violence. Right. And it's it's something that he denies from the first episode when he's sent to the United States by his dear blood brother uh, and overseer, Meng, right? Um, that he is in love with American American culture, right? And we start to see that love in all of its complicated ways uh, unravel uh, in, the, in this particular episode. Um, well, Viet, thank you so much. You know, we're... Here at the end of episode two for uh, the companion podcast of The Sympathizer uh, and in future episodes, we'll dig a little bit deeper into all of the different depths of um, sex, violence, masturbation, and murder. Glad we could end with the squid, Philip. And that's it for us today. Thank you to Amanda Burrell, Hua Shande, and Viet Tan Nguyen for their time and insight. We'll see you again next time when we dive into episode three with Academy Award-winning actor and executive producer Robert Downey Jr., prosthetic effects designer Vincent Van Dyke, and returning guests Don McKellar, Hua Shande, and Viet Tan Nguyen. See you then. Stream new episodes of HBO's original limited series, The Sympathizer, Sundays, exclusively on Max. And subscribe and listen to the podcast after every episode of the show on Max and wherever you get your podcasts. The Sympathizer podcast is produced by the Mashup Americans for HBO 